Welcome everyone to the inaugural streaming series that I'm starting called Productivity Power Hour. And so for those who've been following me for a bit, you might be wondering, well, wait, I thought Thursdays were Obsidian office hours. And so don't worry, we are still going to be talking about a lot of things Obsidian. But one of the things I've realized over time as I was doing more of the Obsidian office hours is there are, well, there's there are a lot of different tools out there that are of interest, that are basically worth sharing, exploring together. So rather than making it solely about Obsidian, I wanted to be able to open up the kind of sort of the forum topics a little bit so that we can sort of explore and learn from different ideas. Because after all, like, again, I'm all for having tools that you sort of are champions behind, really loyal to, but then it's always good to get new ideas and to see how things are going and evolving so that we can go ahead and adapt our ideas. Because at the end of the day, right, isn't our goal to like find ways to be more effective at the things we do and more importantly, like be more impactful in the way that things that matter, right? So rather than being uh, basically being red rigid with like a very specific tool, for example, here, actually, I have a, actually a use case for this, is that one of the things I've seen with people using Obsidian, for example, is that some of them really want to do like space repetition. And so for those who have learned, like done a lot of research into the area, Area, you'll know that Anki, which is A-N-K-I, is like, I think one of the most popular tools for doing that, but they wanted a way to do that in Obsidian. And so while there certainly are plugins and people are figuring out that workflow, some people wanted a little bit more of a plug and play kind of experience. And so other tools might be better suited for that as much as like we want to try to make Obsidian like maybe the single truth for a lot of things, maybe it makes sense for depending on your use case to use something else. So with that said, that's a little bit of a sneak peek to what we'll be talking about next week actually. But as a result, this is the reason why I wanted to go ahead and kind of switch this up. Okay, so our first question from the chat actually that I can talk about here is the uh, from Dom. Why am I, wait, I'm wearing, that's right. These are the Apple Max headphones. And uh, so my impressions of them, all right. So, uh, high level. So when it comes to headphones, right? Actually, this is, this again, what, this is why I'm calling it Productivity Power Hour because we're talking about all things productivity. And I, for, for a lot of people, having the right headphones can be a really, well, it can be a huge deal because after all, especially if you're working in an environment where it's really noisy, and I know that a lot of us are now working from home, but you know, we might have people who are we're like living with, who are making noise or whatnot. You know, it's one thing to, you know, ask people to try to be respectful and quiet. But at the same time, when you want to zone out, you want to zone out and let other people kind of do what they want to do. So headphones are a huge piece of that. So when it comes to headphones, I will let you know that I will be the first to tell you I have bought, I think every single, almost every single headphone that I've seen come on the wire cutter recommendation list over the years as I've tried to figure out ways to basically make it work for me. And so like whether it's the Sony, a lot of, the, there's a lot of recommendations, but so all this to say, why the AirPods Max? Because the the most, the biggest thing you'll hear about people talking about the AirPods Max is it's just so expensive for what it is, right? People will be like, the Sony MDXs, 1000 are really great, great sound quality, much cheaper. And I think there are a couple of other ones that are, again, fantastically reviewed. And honestly, for most people, I do think those are great um, options for them when it comes to headphones. However, I actually had a really specific problem I was trying to solve, which is I have a lot of different Apple devices. So I'm talking like like two to three laptops that various Apple ones, uh, tablets, there's the phone. And so as a result, there's a lot of switching between devices oftentimes, which I know that is not like, it's not the, the typical scenario for most people, right? Most people have like the one work laptop that they have at their work. And so they have their, their headphones paired to the one and that's basically it. They're not really doing a lot of switching, but for me, Context switching is huge because I will be like, for example, right now I'm on my MacBook Pro and I'm here, I might be working. But then if I need to switch up and move somewhere, I actually, I'll bring my MacBook Air, go somewhere else, and that's what I'll be using. And so I wanna be able to switch to that really easily. Well, the problem is that while other devices like the Sony and other ones claim to have like multi-device support, I found that there's just enough lag and friction that it was causing me a lot of problems because it would be like either it would lose connection randomly, then I'd have to spend the time to reset it, and then I have to make sure it's connected, but then, oh wait, it might be feeding from the other device. Like I was spending way more time than I should be on uh, connecting those things. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, for me, the, the AirPods Max basically helped to solve that very problem of very easy to make sure I know which device is connected to. It switches basically almost instantly. Sometimes it gets a little, it, it like jumps ahead of me. So like, for example, if like I am on my computer and then like I bring up my phone, sometimes it'll like try to be clever and switch me over when like I actually just, I just wanted my sound from this. So that's like, I would say a downside of it. But then another thing that I actually really like the AirPods Max is that you can actually use them while they're charging. And that might sound 
it might not sound like a big thing, but a lot of the wireless headphones often require you to basically shut off the headphones entirely. And that to me just like, it's just like a kind of a deal breaker because yes, I, I would love to charge my stuff very consistently at night all the time, but the reality is uh, I forget. And so if I forget or I leave it on the hook and then it's left on for whatever reason, like it's nice to be able to plug it in and it still works exactly as you expect. And then especially for those with regular AirPods, like you're just, you're done. You just throw them in, you have to throw them back in the case because you can't use them. So, and the other thing too, actually with the AirPods Max, I see here Dom in the comments, is that I believe Apple has actually really generous return policy. I don't think people realize this. So that you could actually purchase the Max, try them out. And I think as long as you use them within like, within 30 days, you can actually return them. So to me, like, yes, is it a big investment? It is, but unlike other headphones, which I think don't have as generous a return policy, like you can see if it's worth it for you. And so for me, the comfort level, I can wear it all day. I'm totally fine. I know that some people are afraid of like the over ear, like kind of like squishing their head. And then more importantly, I didn't say, but like they have physical buttons here. So like you can basically toggle the volume uh, really easily, toggle noise canceling. I know that other, again, other S headphones have it, but again, the, the Apple wheel is just a, a little bit more intuitive to me than pressing a button that's like volume up, volume up, volume up. Um, so having a dial basically on the side of my head that lets me fine tune the volume can be a big game changer from uh, personally. So with that said, so I personally, I do recommend the AirPods Max for those one, if you're in the Apple ecosystem and you kind of love Apple products anyways, then it might just be a great experience for you as a whole. But if let's just say you're still in the Apple ecosystem, but you don't really want to spend that much money and you just want a good pair of headphones, in that case, I would honestly say check out Wirecutter for their reviews. Again, I think the Sony MDX 1000s are the ones I've seen most consistently reviewed for like the, the quality and the basically everything. Lots of love for that headphone. Okay, so we have from Nunchi here, can you comment on what you actually put into the slip box of your obsidian? Let's say you're learning uh, things or reading on a book, I'm fairly like cream notes instead of in the words of reference notes. Okay, great. So actually, Nunchi, your question is about to be answered because the main topic for today, which we're gonna probably get into in the next like five minutes, is we're gonna be talking. We're gonna be talking about my note workflow. So with working with Obsidian and how that basically goes about, and I think that will play into sort of how you start to filter in your so sort of the process. I think for creating notes within Obsidian. But uh, yeah, I think. With that, I think we had we got some of those questions out of the way, and I think it's time for us to dive into the meat of today, which is really talking about how I personally create notes in Obsidian and kind of my opinion on how I think, you know, or I guess my framework for what I think would be helpful for people as they create their own notes and build their own digital garden. So with that, let's go ahead and switch on over. All right, boom, let's do this. So, First things first, let's open up Obsidian, shall we? Let's see, let me open up a, let me bring this on over. All right, bump this up a few times so it's larger, and then let's go ahead and create a brand new. No, do, 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 brand, all right, I think note sandbox is what I called it. All right, let's do this. Jimena, thanks. The uh, Believe it or not, actually, that background is a default background that's built into the Apple OS. Like, if you go into the backgrounds, they've added it. And what's cool about it, which I can't show you right now, is that you can actually configure it to watch the time of day. So this actually, so let me, go, so let me just actually contextualize this a little bit. So you all see how this is like this beautiful landscape right now. The sun is kind of up. This is actually reflective of like the time of day, basically. And so when the evening comes, it'll actually get dark and then actually become like full evening. And then in the morning, it'll be like this sort of sunrise thing. So it's actually really cool to have like, which I imagine is basically just SVG effects if I were to like guess on how I would implement this. Like, but nonetheless, it's cool that like without doing any work, I kind of get this like dynamic thing to represent like the day as we go on. So anyways, fun little tangent there. Okay, so today the, oh, okay, those, those are my notes. Let me close that off. I'm trying to be more organized about this stuff. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is a question that I got actually on Tuesday's stream. Oh, actually, okay, hold on. Let me rewind back because I think Talented has a question regarding that. So let me go ahead and if you go to your desktop and screensaver here, I have a bunch of obviously ran, I have a bunch of desktops here, but you'll notice here inside of the desktop pictures that there's something called dynamic desktop. And so that's something you can go ahead and download. And so there's a bunch of various ones here, but I kind of like the abstract one. Actually, is this the right one? Maybe the tertiary one is the correct one. Nope, that's the wrong one too. Okay, this is it. Okay, so you can see here, um, so if I download this one, 
This is, oh, that's downloading right now. Okay, so this is the one I'm currently using. So as you can see, it actually tells you the darkness, but here's like where it is in light mode. This is uh, dynamic, but then here's where it's dark, for example. So this is like usually the nighttime view. I realize this is covering things up. So here's a, ah, yeah, I closed it. Okay, so there we go. Secondary desktop here, dark, okay. So anyways, so this is like the night view of the thing. So it's cool. Like they have honestly a lot of really pretty ones. So I think I had this one up for a while. And then for anyone looking for more of a tropical view, I was using this one as well. Oh, it's cool that they actually uninstalled it. I think oh, maybe that was on a different machine. But look, here's like this beautiful beach. I just love it. So anyhow, so I think for me, water is a nice element for me. So I'm going to go ahead and just make this dynamic. So once again, it'll update according to the time of the day and change in that way. You get the feeling of your background changing without it actually changing, which is kind of nice. So cool. Actually, now that we've talked about that, I kind of have to add a timestamp for that. Dynamic background on Mac OS. Cool. Okay. So yes, so to answer Jimena's question, I am on Raycast. And to be honest, I think I want to do a whole episode of Productivity Power Hour on Raycast uh, because I think it's a great tool and I think a lot of people could really make use of it. So <laughs> no, Jimena, I love it. This is, this is what it's for, right? This is, this is why the live stream is here. If I wanted to give a concerted talk across the uh, entire thing, honestly, I would just record a YouTube video. But I love the interaction here. That's honestly why, why I do the streams. So. With that, the question here for today and the, the bulk of what the time we're going to talk about here, which actually we already had a question here from Nunchi, is really what is my workflow in, re in terms of like creating notes within Obsidian? And I've touched on this in various ways in past Obsidian office hours, but I wanted to take this particular session to really focus on it and more importantly, outline a kind of framework for people going forward. So uh, basically, so this is a shout out to Baratsky who, if you can't make it today, um, again, thanks so much for the question on Tuesday. A lot of times when people are doing their, their sort of getting into personal knowledge, knowledge management, and to be honest, this advice applies really to any tool you're using. So whether it's Obsidian, whether it's Rome or some other one, there, the problem I think that we've commonly found with writing notes is that we end up creating these islands of isolation. So in other words, you come in here, right? And let's say we create a new file, so create new note. And the note on this one in particular is, let's say, a talk about Raycast, right? That's like my note for the day because I was like, oh, okay, like, hey, like, so people in the chat want me to talk about Raycast. Okay. So this on its own is basically about, or well, I guess I have some metadata in here, but let's just say it's like this. Let's say, let's just simplify it down. This is about as basic of a note as we get with when it comes to writing down ideas, right? The most common example of this is, or sorry, the analogy I would make to this in real life is taking a post-it note, jotting it down, and then putting it on your, your like desktop screen so you'll remember, right? Except here's the problem is that with most note-taking apps, unless, you're really good at your tab management, which if you do talk to me, I'd love to hear about that. Most of the time this stuff gets lost. And so unlike a post-it note that's on your screen, or actually, you know what, if we continue with that analogy of a post-it note on your screen, is that you start putting so many post-it notes, you have a hard time figuring out where something is. And so you might find yourself recreating something, or more importantly, it might get lost, right? And then the problem with most note taking, and in fact, this is not even like an old thing, right? I'm talking about paper, like post-it notes and stuff. I found this is actually a very frequent problem with people even in Notion, for example. And for those who don't know, Notion is a very popular sort of like knowledge management app right now. But one of its biggest problems is that a lot of people who aren't quite used to sort of the hierarchy of how it's being used and like the architecture of it are creating a bunch of notes and then basically losing them. And so this is why personally, if so... When it comes to step one of creating any note, regardless of what you want to take a note on, I would say your first thing to do is not create a brand new note. All right. And this may feel kind of counterintuitive because you're like, wait a second, Ben, like you, I'm like, for me, I'm trying to take a note on the fact that I need to talk about Raycast, right? So why, why would I not create a new note? That doesn't make sense. And the reason for this is because personal knowledge management systems grow because you're leveraging what you've done before with what you want to do in the future or like what you care about right now. And the thing is that when you create a new note, you're basically ignoring everything you've ever done in the past, right? And so what I mean by this is like, let's say for instance, like let's close this note and, then, and let's say, let's fast forward in time. It's like a week later. And then someone else is like, hey, Ben, I would really love for you to talk about Raycast. And I'm like, oh yeah, I... I uh, where did that heck i'm just going to create a new note and i'm gonna be like okay we're gonna say you know talk about raycast on you know 
product productivity power hour, right? And it's like someone requested this. And over time, what you end up getting is this junction of sort of like a cluster uh, of notes that honestly just end up repeating the same thing when in fact, it probably would be helpful to know that this is something that you've done before. And so instead, what I'm saying, the very first step of creating any note, regardless of context is one, I would say, especially if you're on Obsidian, disabling the create note hotkey. So the way you do this is inside of your hotkeys, right? You can create a new note. So you'll notice that for my create a new note, for example, it actually is, it, it's blank. It used to be command N. In fact, that's what it is for most people. Because in fact, if you've been using any software for a period of time, that is the universal command for creating something new. But to you, based on the framework that I'm proposing to you though, as you can hear, I don't think you should create a new note because once again, we ignore the past. So what do we do instead? We want to open the quick switcher. So you'll notice here that I've mapped two different keys to quick switcher, command N and command O. And so what that basically does is it, it helps me break the muscle memory of creating a new note like directly, but more importantly, if I want to open a note, then it's the same context. And over time, I'm starting to actually meld the two together. And so what this does is means that when I cl click command N in the future, what I want to do is, okay, oh, I want to talk about Raycast, right? So your next step when you're creating your, jotting down your note inside of this, the quick switcher is basically, how would you like, if you only had 10 seconds to write down this note, what would it be called? And the reason I think this kind of rule of thumb helps is because if we think a lot about the way we recall things, a lot of times they're based on sort of like gut sort of instinct about uh, on things, right? And so when you can kind of force yourself to be descriptive on what you're looking to do, this helps to basically over time design yourself a file note that's actually easier to find because you've taken the time to go like, what is the essence for this, right? Because if I'm just like idea to talk about Raycast or whatever, like that's nice. But what would be nice is probably about, like you said, as you can see here, I'm already seeing um, results. But if I'm like on, you know, product, productive, po productivity, power hour, like live stream, right? This is probably about as specific as I could possibly get in about a 10 second thing. And then the reason this is great is because you'll know when I hit command enter, it actually does create a new note because at the time when I was creating, let's say it's a talk about Alfred on PPH, you'll see on this, on this UI that it, it tells you that in the past, you haven't really written note about this before. And this is, this is ultimately the power and leverage of use of creating a digital garden of knowledge management is that you're leveraging your past. And so now if you hit enter, or in my case, if you hit, or not even just hit enter, I use command enter because I want to open it in a new pane. This will actually go ahead and create that new note. But now you've synergized the, th the work you've done before with this. So now all of a sudden, if I want to talk about Raycast, you can see I have three different notes. So honestly, for me, this is probably a little too verbose. I'm just going to delete this one. Let me delete, oh, delete everywhere. Yes, 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 just delete, 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 delete. Okay, so talk about Raycast on basically productivity power hour. So for me, that PPH is the, the, the acronym that I'm using. Okay. The next step in the, the sort of the framework of ideas as you're creating notes, because you now you've, you've, to be honest, even just this alone is huge. Because if you do nothing else, if you add no other metadata, what you end up finding is that you'll eventually start to accumulate notes and you start to hit on things that are recurring. And as they recur, you can build on those notes, add more context, et cetera. So it might be like, oh, a new person requested this, right? So it might just be like, oh, well, like, you know, now another person has said, they wanted to learn about, you know, screen management with, you know, Raycast, for example. Like, and then there you go. That way this note slowly builds up like this whole idea of talking about Raycast. But if you just have these, all these fragmented notes about what I'm trying to talk about on Raycast, it kind of becomes hard to aggregate. And so the counterpoint that I often hear about this is like, well, what you could do is you could have like this list of most updated notes and then you can go through that. But to that, I would sort of, my counter argument to that is how many of us are actually really good at processing an inbox? Don't get me wrong. I think it's a great habit and a workflow to build, but it's, it's very time intensive a lot of times. And we often get very aspirational about processing inboxes, but I don't know about you, but I have a lot of things in my bookmark to do list that often sit unnoticed because why? Because it's just too much work to like get those things through the pipeline. And so the more we can kind of make 
knowledge occur and surface in, or, in an organic way is, to me, I think the best way to organically grow our knowledge management without extra work. I think, and that's the key part of this, is that my workflow for creating notes is making things as easy as possible so that I don't have to go back and retrofit like the note later on. So now that we're in this part, right? So technically, if you want to talk about note framework, like taking note frameworks, I think you could, you could stop there and you'd be very productive. But we're going to extend on this a little bit because the next steps here is that over time as you're creating notes, you're going to notice that you have specific um, problems you're trying to solve. And then it is, it's not going to make a lot of sense for you to over time like start tagging things. So, so let me rewind a little bit on that. So what I mean by this is that, again, assuming we have, I'm going to assume a little bit of knowledge of Obsidian right now, is that we know that there are various ways to link information in Obsidian. And so this also goes for Rome and other things, but we have tags, for example, we can link specific notes. So for example, here, for example, I linked Raycast. So if I open Raycast here, it'll actually go ahead and actually like link the two together, which is super nice. So that in the future, if I'm like, hey, I'm on Raycast and I look on the right-hand side, I'll see that there was a mention to talk about Raycast on Productivity Power Hour. And so I can naturally see that relationship, right? And so the question here from Nunchi here, I think which applies to this next step is, how we make the existing files easily. Oh, you're talking about existing files. Okay, let me let me get to that in a little bit. And so at this point, what you're gonna wanna do then is as you get, so at this point we've created notes, right? You have data, but you're starting to get in the sense that like, I wanna be able to segment my data and get specific lists of things. And so an example for me is, uh, as we've seen on the stream before, is like, I might want to know, for example, the various courses that I'm taking, right? And so let's go ahead and let me open up my sandbox note for this. And so if I want to see all the various courses I'm taking, right, the way I could do this is using the data view plugin. It makes it pretty easy for me to just create a list from things that are tagged type course. And so just like that, we'll see that I have a bunch, like it automatically queries a bunch of the notes that I currently have that are all tagged courses. Now, granted, I need to clean this up, but the idea here is that you now start to think about over time the categories that make the most sense for your particular knowledge management system. And so for me, as I learn things, I tag things with course. If it's a specific book, I'll tag it type book, for example. And then it's really about customizing it to solve a specific problem. So context is really, really important. So in this regard, so to Nunchi's question here regarding existing files, I would say that one of the things that people often find themselves wanting to do is like go back in time and retrofit all their notes to the existing framework. And so one of the things we've seen done on my stream before is that like my Ben Code Zen page or not Ben Code Zen, my Build with Ben page and Obsidian Office Hour pages, those have been evolved over time. And so I've like sort of evolved best practices and that kind of thing. But to me, I think the best use of your time a lot of times is to really only go back and retrofit it when it actually fixes a problem that you have. So for example, if right now I notice that, hey, look, there was a course in here that I've, I, I don't, I'm not seeing it in here, right? For example, let's just say it's like the D3 course that I'm taking right now. Let's see, D3 with Shirley Wu. Is that course on here? Let's see, I don't think introduction. So if I look in here, actually, how's this even alphabetized? Let me sort this by, oop, let me go back. go back, back, here we go. So I can sort by name, I believe that should work. Okay, that kind of work. Wait, introduction to D3, so that happens to be there. But the key thing here is that when it's missing, go and add the metadata. And so I have, I've talked about metadata in various ways on the stream, so I won't talk about that today. But just know that like, the pressure to often add metadata to existing notes, I think is one of the reasons people burn out on knowledge management systems. Don't get me wrong, if you're looking for like a low key thing to do while you're watching TV and you wanna go through then, Oh, like it's basically pattern recognition ultimately when it comes to metadata and tagging things so that they're discoverable. But to me, the thing is that it's kind of like, if you think about like, oh, how do I phrase this? Like you're trying to, knowledge management systems are useful because you can find the things that are most relevant to the problem you're trying to solve, right? Stickiness and making things engaging are the key for this sort of like interaction with your information. And so as a result, if you're just arbitrarily just adding metadata to things, I think what I find is, at least at least for me, I get bored. Because I'm like, okay, this is a blog post, this is a book, this is an article, this is this, and this is a topic for JavaScript, this is a topic for Obsidian. 
But then here's the thing. A lot of times those things that like, how do I put this? It's pre -op it's the whole like pre-optimization bit where like you've gone ahead and like optimized all the classification, but you're actually not even using it. And the, I think this is one of the trickiest parts of knowledge management in general is you don't really know what you need until you need it kind of thing. And then when you do need it, then that's where you spend the time to go back and retrofit things. So another example for me right now is actually I'm going to get to Wellbrain's question, I think, in this particular stream, too, is I'm actually not going to manage all of my course material and resources in Obsidian really anymore as far as like a sort of single source of truth. Because I found that it's basically the problem it's trying to solve for me is, is too tricky um, for me to do with Obsidian plus all the things that I need it to do. And so as a result, the key things I find with, so, okay. So the key thing I'm trying to say here is that don't feel obligated to go back and just tag everything. As you go through, as you look for things, let that naturally surface. And so that honestly is one of the nice things about the using the title bit too, is because if I look at something like Raycast, look at how many things c come up in the search, right? And then this tells me how often it's been talked about. And then as I'm going through, I can rename things. But then more importantly, as far as Nunchi's question goes, I may, I'm a big proponent of aliases. Like aliases are perhaps one of the biggest features or underrated features about Obsidian because when you do things inside of the, the title of the note, you're limited to actually what characters are available in the file structure. And more importantly, you can't do duplicate names uh, because it'll just conflict with other files. So aliases are such a huge win because in the event I want to call this Raycast for whatever reason, and that has like a significant meaning to me, that's totally fine because when I add this alias to this note, this means that in the future when I'm talking about Raycast, you'll see that there's a Raycast note for the Raycast app, and then there's also Raycast for the introduction to D3 with Shirley Wu, for example. And so aliases, I think, are perhaps, if, if nothing else, I would say tags are helpful for when you know you're starting when you know the classification system of the notes you're trying to do. So like I said, if it's a type course, it's a type book, and then those are like reference notes. And then if you have like quotes that you want to save and your notes on it, then those will be type quotes. And then the second most useful thing for making things exposable is the alias. Because in the event also that you're like, you know what, I don't, in my head, I'm going to call it like intro to D3. That's what I want to call it most of the time. That's fine. You can add it to another way so that in the future, when you're saying intro to D3, it'll actually show up the way your brain wants to do it, not even to do it, to, to like search for things. So that's that's the key piece of this, is that you get the chance to allow your brain different context into the note. And that, that I think is ultimately the key when it comes to searchability, is as things become important to you, right? Whether it's that, oh, for example, you'll see that one, I so one, I tack this as a course, like all the way down here, right? I also tagged, for example, like when, what platform it's on, because maybe I want to look at all the different things that I've learned for front end masters, right? I also want to tag Shirley herself because I'm a big fan of her work and it's nice to know that this course is associated with her. And so it's this kind of stuff that you'll start to get a, a kind of a sixth sense regarding the metrics that are important to you. And so as a result, this is why I would say I would not recommend just simply copying someone's system as a result. And so I think one of the problems I found with most note-taking frameworks is that they kind of impose a very opinionated way for all the things you want to do. And as someone who's played around with metadata, like, uh, like, like here, here's my back matter section template. Like, look how many fields I've played around with. Creator, publisher, vendor, estimated delivery date, recommended by, inspired by. I've, I'm clearly trying to play around with structure and exposition, but... I will tell you, as someone who dove kind of way in the rabbit hole with this, is that if you're not careful, you're going to end up feeling like you're filling out a form every single time you make a note. And that, to me, is a really quick way to kill off momentum. And so to Nunchi's question, right, at the earlier on in the stream, which is regarding, let me see, da 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 oh, here we go. Okay, so when you're, like, learning things or reading a book, right, well, every, when you're learning about the book, what you don't want to do is have to recreate things every single time. And so the next step to making note creation useful is getting comfortable with the idea of creating templates, but quick ones. Because a lot of times I think when people look at templates, they think of this as this like huge effort of automation that needs to last forever. When to me, templates are used to save you time to solve a specific problem, and then eventually they go away when they're no longer useful. 
So a great example of this is actually the very context that Nunchi here is mentioning, which is when you're reading a book. So let's say, for example, right now I'm reading a book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There, right? And so this book, shout out to Prince, uh, who's also on Twitch. So check out his stream. I, I will try to drop the link later. But this is a great book. What Got You Here Won't Get You There. But how would I take notes on this if I were to go about things. And so one thing you could do is certainly take all your notes within the context of the book. But eventually your, your notes just get super long. And so if you're wondering, this is an export from Readwise. So this is all the things that I've highlighted. But what you probably actually want to do is you want to jot down your own notes, your own ideas, because that's what's interesting, right, about this new way of notes is linked thinking so that you can then refer to pieces of it and have it link across ways in smaller chunks rather than this monolith of a note. And so if I were to take notes on what got you won't get you there, for example, then what I would do is also, I don't know why this thing is here. So that, oh wait, actually I need that metadata. This stuff is gone, but, 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 okay, much better. Okay, so when you're taking notes on this, right, using sort of the framework that I've presented, you would start by saying like, let's say that, okay, let's just actually talk about a very specific point here. So let's talk about, do, 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 uh, do, 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 do. All right, let's actually talk about this point right here. So this, in this point, just to give you a summary, basically in The New Yorker, the film director Harold Ramis was talking about two different, like the career of two different actors, Chevy Chase, and uh, who is uh, very big. And in his opinion, he talks about this idea of proprioception, right? Which is the idea of knowing where you are and basically like where you're oriented. So to be more specific, uh, he's talking about this idea of proprioception in regarding to losing sense of his touch of like sort of the impression that he was sending to people. And this was interesting to me because I think a lot of times when you're going through your career, especially as you get older in life, a lot of things that we do, we have this very, we have this idea of who we're trying to become. And then we lose the sense of who we're actually, like the person that we're actually projecting to other people. So you might think, oh, I'm pro projecting a sense of confidence by always sharing my ideas and being very bold, you know, like very bold and like courageous with that. But other people might see it as like someone who's uh, sort of taking over the conversation or who's not listening to other people's ideas. Even though at one point, right, like your bold headed, like your sort of, your bulwark sort of approach to like sharing things and trying to get a seat at the table was very useful for you gaining notoriety and stuff in the future, that, that very skill that, that helped you do that can actually be detrimental to how other people perceive you, right? And so with this, with the idea of proprioception, let's say we're trying to take a note on this thing, right? So I'm just going to copy this for now. So typically what I would do is I would, I would come in here and I would open my notes and say, okay, do I have anything on proprioception? Clearly nothing exists. So I'll hit command enter, open the new note. And so then I can like, let's say I had the quote on hand and I got, went ahead and typed it in, great. And so the thing is, is that now that I've done this, I can be like, you know, this is interesting from a sense of self-awareness and personal growth and development. Okay, so now that I've taken note, this is great. But the problem is, once again, if you think about it, this, this proprioception note is actually, at this point, a complete island in and of himself. So unless I remember to literally type proprioception later on, I'm going to forget. So if I were processing this now, right, in the process of like reflecting on it, one thing I probably would do is be like, I would create an alias that's probably like disjointed perspective of self versus other people's impression. And so what you're kind of noticing though, which is kind of interesting, is that by creating an alias like this, what this allows me to do is that in the future when I'm searching for the note and I'm like, oh, something about section. Okay, I mean, appropriate session is jumping up, but if I'm just like, I don't know, like self versus other, oh, here we go. Self versus other people's impression. Oh, it's proprioception, this is great. And so you're creating kind of multiple keywords into the note. But then more importantly, right, we were talking about templates. And so now that we're in the templating phase, you're gonna be like, okay, well, this thing is a note that was inspired specifically from where was it inspired from? So let me just add my inspired by a little block. This was inspired by the what got you here won't get you there. This is really where it came from. And the thing is, is that having to type that every single time when I'm reading a book is going to become annoying very, very quickly. 
So what I would do instead is I would create a new note, right? Called like what got you here, note template, for example. And then what I do is I go ahead and say, okay, this is good. I want this over here. And then I'm gonna, cause I wanted to always tag the book, right? When I'm taking a note. And then I'm not gonna worry about this title right here. We're just gonna go, whoop, that's not what I wanted at all. We're not gonna worry about the title. And then we're not gonna even worry about front matter. Let's keep it really simple, right? Cause templates are a whole thing and I've done um, stuff on this before. So this is about as simple as the note template gets. So I'm gonna go ahead and move it into my templates folder. Wait, no such file directory open. What? Move, let me see, test, move to templates. I hope that worked. What got you here? Here, note template. Okay, that did work. I don't know what was what that what all that was about. Okay. So as a result, in the future, now let's say the next thing, right, is that we're taking a note on is let's say we're talking about, uh, I don't know, let's talk about this paragraph regarding personal maps, right? Tracing the distance between who you want to be and, and like where you are right now. So then I might create a note that's like, okay, personal maps, this is great. Never created one, here's personal map. I'll create a quote here. And then actually what I do actually at this point is I'd actually go ahead and um, replace all of this with my what got you here note template, which automatically tags things. And then I can go ahead and throw down the notes accordingly from it. And so as a result, you've now abstracted away and allow yourself to take notes very quickly while following the framework of checking existing ideas to see if they exist. But then more importantly, if they don't, then you're automatically still tagging all the metadata that's relevant to it. And the reason why I was talking about temporary templates is because when I'm done with what got you here, won't get you here, it actually makes sense for me to just delete it. It doesn't really make sense for me to keep accumulating notes uh, or templates for this particular book because I've done, I'm finished reading it. And if I really need to tag it in the future, that's fine. I can do that. And so, so now that we talked about templating, do, 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 do. Okay. And so that's the key thing, basically to Nunchi's question here regarding creating notes in your own words, which I think is really, really like, that is perhaps the most important thing about to note taking is not just writing, like copying things verbatim, but actually writing your own interpretation and engaging with it. And when you do that, things become that much more stickier. So Nanchi, I do hope that helps to sort of clarify regarding sort of my workflow regarding this. And so let's bring up now my uh, power hour number one here. And we're going to take a look at this. Let's see over time. Okay. Yes. So once again, so at a high level, right? The framework here is one, don't create a new note. You want to open your quick switcher. That's like your first thing. You write your core idea in the file title. And then if something exists, either augment it or figure out a way to differentiate it. Cause there's probably a very specific reason you need a new note that's different from the old one. And then what that allows you to do is over time, you'll start to recognize patterns that exist in the things that you care about and the way you search for things in your brain. And then finally, then you can use your templates as a way to help to automate the process of making things faster when you're taking those notes. And that takes a little bit of practice when it comes to what pieces of information that are most relevant to the things that you're tagging. And so again, it's more of an art than a science. So don't be afraid to add some stuff and then take it away over time. Because once again, as your information services organically, you'll find that like, you just get a net, like, this is how you build intuition, honestly, because if everything were easily predictable and, and every single time you would just create one template and that would be it forever. But you and I both know that's not how life works. A lot of change happens. Context changes our needs. And so we got to be willing to go with the flow with this kind of stuff. And that's really, really important. Okay. So the other thing that I do want to get to now is well brain here with a great question that I actually do want to cover. Why did I switch from Notion to Obsidian? So for those who, in case you haven't heard of Notion or your company hasn't adopted it yet, it's fairly common. Uh, so here is Notion. Um, so there is a whole desktop app, but I'm just going to use the web browser uh, version for this. As you can see here, this is a basically a note taking app where let's say talk about Raycast. That was the, kind of the thing we used earlier. Notion is honestly a tool that I honestly do love a lot. I actually haven't abandoned it. So that's like probably my first disclaimer. I haven't abandoned it in its entirety. One of the things I really love about it is it's really like a lot of the things about its UI is really intuitive. So in the sense that like, oh, like what do I want to talk about? It's very easy for me to then sort of in this sort of WYSIWYG UI to add bulleted lists, right? To be like, let's talk about, for example, this is actually stuff I do want to talk about was so uh, screen or sorry, uh, window management, you know, 
GitHub issues, file searching, and then be like, let's just say, for example, like, what do I not want to talk about, right? Then I could be like, again, let's just, again, apples, bananas, cherries. So I actually don't have something I necessarily don't want to talk about. But what's cool about Notion then too is that it's not just a text editor because you can do more stuff like this where I can take this sort of blocks and then jot them in this column, take these three things, jot them in this column, and now I have a two column layout. And then I can also do really cool things like automatically generating like a table of contents, for example. So here's my table of contents. So now if I add a heading for like talking points, Right. And then more importantly, I can do things like call out, like don't forget to shout out Jimena and team for suggesting this topic. Like it's very, very pretty. And then on top of that, you get a chance to like easily share this. So if I turn this into a website, I can copy this. So I'll, just for uh, kicks and giggles, I'll drop this in the chat. So with that said, and now check this out. Now there's like this website that people can go to, right? So if I go to an incognito browser, even though you're not logged in, even though you don't have a Notion account, you could actually see everything that I created and it looks like a website. And this is like, this is one of the things that made me fall in love with Notion and because also collaboration, super duper easy. Now, the question of course here from Wellbrain, which is a fair one is why did I switch? And so I say to switch is important to understand the context that I was switching from. One of the things I ran into with Notion is the searching is just kind of slow. Uh, so that when I wanted to look for specific things, like when your Notion, well, so let me be very clear. When your Notion space is very small, it's actually pretty decent at searching for things. But once it starts to grow and you start to do a lot of complex things, it starts to slow to a crawl to the point where it kind of gets in the way of my workflow. Because if you've watched me do any live coding or sort of Obsidian stuff over time, you'll, you're probably not surprised to learn that or to, to hear me say that usually when I'm trying to do things, I want things to almost be at a, like at a moment's notice, I want to be able to switch context. So when I'm in Obsidian, I want to be able to easily insert a new template, right? I, for me, that's like command control N and then I can just insert like a, you know, a build with Ben template. Like I want things to be able to flow like just like water down a river, right? I don't want to have to slow down because I've got to wait for the gates to open to let the next flow of water go in. Like I want to go, go, go. Notion made that very, very difficult for me over time because eventually I was waiting like a few seconds just to add a note. And that might not sound like a lot, but when you're trying to like go through and iterate and like just expand on things, that can be really, really expensive. And so that to me very quickly became like one of the biggest hurdles. But the other thing too, as well, is something that I ran into and it's not Notion's fault, okay? To be very clear, almost every single s software as a service out there has gone through the horror of having their servers go down. And so I don't fault them for this. It's just that it happened to come at a time I was sort of thinking about this stuff and the server, the Notion servers went down. And what did that mean? That meant I had no access to any of my notes or ideas or anything. And that is really scary because you spend all this time creating all this stuff, taking notes, and then it's gone, right? It's not available. And once again, you can be like, well, Penn, you use GitHub. So if GitHub goes down, you can't share, like point made, but this is also one of the reasons why you clone, right, the code down so that in the event NPM goes down, hopefully you have everything installed so that you can run everything locally. And that was a big thing to me. Could I run things locally? Could I own the data that I'm creating? Because while I haven't heard anything regarding Notion and data privacy, so I'm not really concerned about this end, but I've heard from other note-taking apps that like the reason the investors are interested in it is because they want to mine the data that's in the notes, which to me is just a, incredibly bunkers because notes are about as personal as it gets, like short of someone creating a device that can read your innermost thoughts and record them somewhere for other people to view. Like notes are about as private as, as it gets, honestly, if you ask me personally, because you're basically willing to jot some ideas down that are in writing that's that you're hoping to reference later. But here's the thing though, even though it's in writing, it's not permanent in the sense of like, you're still like working through ideas. And so this is also why like, for example, like, you know, like a slight tangent, but you have to be careful what you post on social media because when you post, like if I post a tweet, if it's not well thought through, there's a chance it'll be misconstrued. If it can be misconstrued, then that can lead to a whole series of issues because why? The thought wasn't completely formulated. And so imagine if like a bunch of my half formed notes went public or some machine learning went through it and like assumed things like, 
no. <laughs> that's that's too scary for me. So data ownership and privacy also then suddenly became one of the things that I realized I want to be able to own this stuff because as much as I love things like notions, so example, so if I go back to notion here, notion, for example, has really, really great, like sort of databases. And so when I'm in here, you'll see that I can just be like, oh, here's my content. And I can be like apples, you know, bananas. I, this is really my go-to. I should come up with a different list to use. But like, it's so easy to like tag things to be like, this is a fruit, you know, and this is like a yellow fruit. What else I can say fruit. I can say like yellow, for example. And you see like the UI here is super intuitive, right? I'm just clicking things just work. I do love that. But here's the funny thing though. I think at one point this wasn't, but like, I cannot export this as a CSV. I can export this via a markdown. But anyway, so as a result, data ownership became kind of tricky. That said though, I still use Notion a lot for collaboration things. So anytime I need someone to actually see something or I'm sharing a workspace with someone, Notion is still excellent for this. And more importantly, especially the, the idea of databases that are queryable with the Notion API, then this is where, for example, I am going to be managing all my content from this. I think I actually did a build with Ben with this on a resource page. But you can see here, this is how I'm tracking all of the courses that I've created, all the talks that I'm um, going to be giving. Um, and this is currently my way of doing that so that I can query them, put them in the website, et cetera, and make it easier for people to kind of get resources. And so all that to say, the TLDR, is that Notion is really great for collaboration and sort of more formal documents is kind of how I see it. When it comes to personal knowledge management, digital gardening, um, Obsidian has a huge win as far as data privacy, data ownership, and the sort of the backlinking that work, like it works really well. Searching, querying things, aliases, that stuff works wonders inside of Obsidian. Inside of, inside of Notion, not so much, right? Like if I wanted to call my content something else, I basically can't. I have to add like a parenthesis as like my content alias. And now this is polluting everything, right? This is polluting my sidebar. This pollutes every single link that comes into play. So not, not having aliases, not great either. So well, Brain, I hope to, that helped to answer your question. And so, oh, I see here from Radio Signal. Hello, is Notion similar to Evernote? Okay, so it's been a while since I've used Evernote, but I would say no. Well, okay, take that back. If you were asking if Notion is similar to Evernote, I would say yes. The reason I was saying no at first is I think I was thinking of all the things that Notion does differently than Evernote. And Evernote, for those that don't know, was like the king of note-taking apps for the longest time. And then over time for me personally, I think I got to a scaling point where it was too slow for me. And so again, it would take me like seconds to open up the app. It took time to load things. I've heard they've improved the performance. So let me be very clear. That is an experience from years ago. This has, I have no current, like, I don't have no guideposts right now as far as how things are with Evernote right now. But as far as I'm aware of Radio Signal, one of the things that make Notion really powerful compared to something like Evernote is Evernote is more, at least I've seen more designed for the individual. And whereas like Notion has kind of been designed for collaboration from the ground up. So in that regard, it's almost like Google Docs on steroids in the sense that like it's easy to create workspaces, to create these relational databases that can then go ahead and talk to each other and then people can go in there, add their notes, comments. Like there is a big aspect of team collaboration that's part of Notion. I think I think Evernote has a team aspect as well, but I, I would say that at least from what I've seen people use and the potential that's there, Notion seems to be leading the charge as far as this goes. So, and again, I, I think I've showed you a little bit, but the nice thing about Notion too, is that like all of these database things basically contain pages within it. So I could create like individual headings. I can create like a whole website just for this individual thing, which is pretty awesome from like a personalization perspective. So you get a lot of the Evernote like things that I think I really liked about Evernote, but then you get basically superpowers to do additional things regarding permissions. So as you can see here, you can share with different things. You can determine what level of access they have with a simple drop down. This kind of stuff that like to me, I just absolutely love Notion for showing that permission and this kind of stuff doesn't have to be as difficult as a lot of places make it off to be. And so, so to Nunchi's, I think for, I think probably the last question for the day, a Nunchi here in the chat, if I can't have confidence that a note taking software can't be the permanent single of tr single truth, I don't think it can work as the second brain. Ooh, this is an interesting thought here. I think the hardest thing at this point with the permanent single source of truth is it becomes, well, how do I put this? 
the problem ends up becoming what you're using the source of truth for. And so in the exam and like sort of the problems you're solving. And so again, I'm talking about a real example here in a perfect world, or I mean, even now I probably do have obsidian notes for all of these individual things, right? Different courses I've made different things. But part of the problem is at least right now is that because we're working in a sort of a plain text format, you are limited to then your ability to one type everything correctly, but more importantly, like your tooling now, if you want to, with like take that information out as an API to then programmatically generate a website or something for it. That's where it becomes tricky. And so I think this is one of the reasons tooling fragmentation exists so much in productivity tools is because most people figure that, gosh, this is way too hard of a problem. So I'm only going to do one thing. I'm going to do one thing really well. To be honest, I would not be surprised if eventually like Obsidian provides like an easier API, especially for developers to work with so that you can actually query against your like Obsidian notes in a way that feels more like a traditional API because, and the reason I'm saying that is because I think experienced Obsidian developers would probably tell me that I could probably develop a plugin that exports it, but that's that's a decent amount of work for me right now, right? Um, I have a lot of things I'm different taking care of. So for me, the quickest thing for me to do at the moment is to use Notion to solve that problem. But I think Nunchi brings up a great point in that like one of the reasons I think a lot of us are on the quest for that like single source of truth is so that we don't have to be fragmented amongst the various things. And so to Jacob's point, yeah, there is Obsidian Publish. And so for me, like I would like Obsidian Publish, but in an API form. I actually don't want... I don't want them to be the ones building everything, right? Because I have like my own framework that I'm using. And then more importantly, I might want to customize how things look. And right now to customize your Obsidian Publish is basically limited to your ability to like write a bunch of CSS. And I'd like to do more with it than that. So here's the hoping that they kind of make that a bit more open so that people can really customize things based on the data. But with all that said, fair enough to, to Nunchi's point regarding second brain, you know, <laughs> Jacob, I have been tempted to reverse engineer the API there. Yeah, I know. So many things to do, so little time. All right. Well, with that, let's switch on over to the camera. So I know, once again, I think to Walbrain's point, I know that this is something I've covered to some extent regarding sort of note taking flow and that kind of stuff, but I did want to create a dedicated session for this so that going forward, you know, when this goes on YouTube, for example, and you know, for those watching this, now you actually know what the topic is because some of the past Obsidian office hours, I've just had a trickier getting the topics to be focused on a specific area. And then more importantly, like going through the process of getting transcriptions and that kind of stuff has just been a lot because in case it, this is uh, in case for those who don't know, like this is all just kind of stuff I'm kind of doing on my own. So I don't have like a team that's helping me to do this again in a perfect world. Eventually, if I can, I would love to hire a team to help me to support me in all this stuff so that we can do uh, more of this and make the stuff that we answer on live streams more sort of searchable so that we can then just point people to those questions. But in the meantime, this is my best effort forward for starting to consolidate things in a way that people can find things. So yeah, with that said, Closing thoughts. Yeah, so I think as far as like, so per, some productivity perspective, one of the things I've been thinking a lot about, and you know, with 2022 here, and we're basically already kicked things off, is for me, productivity, it's easy to, like a lot of times the word productivity is, is associated with how many things we get done, right? It's like a checklist. And I would tell you as someone who's uh, gone through a lot of different career transitions as far as like trying to figure out what I wanted or aspire to do certain things. Eventually you get to a point where you just feel like you're checking things off and you're making a millimeter of progress in a million directions. And so in 2022, one of the things I'd really like to do better going forward is really asking myself the question, if I'm going to do something, if I'm going to commit to speaking, if I'm going to commit to, you know, doing something, does it align with the values, with my values? And is it creating the kind of impact that I want? And because a lot of times it can be very tempting to do things because it feels like it could be helpful. But I found that this has been actually really helpful in sort of starting to make better decisions regarding where my time is going so that I don't overcommit and more importantly to try to avoid burnout. So that's my little bit as far as my own productivity journey. And there will be honestly a lot more stuff regarding that in the future. I'm excited for some of the things I've been working on on the side to share with y'all, but that's my little piece for there. 
And so as a reminder, so with 2022, we uh, the streaming has started back up. And so you can always check out the schedule at www.benkozen slash schedule. Basically, you'll be seeing all the latest as far as upcoming streams. I'll probably be trying to do it for basically at least a month out for each one. And going forward, I'm actually going to be tagging them with specific topics. So you can come with your specific questions. But more importantly, if you want to make a specific... That way, like for those who might have like limited time to attend the live streams, you can know whether or not you might want to attend a specific one over another one. So, you know, as a sneak peek for next week, we're actually going to be talking about another note-taking software that's come on the scene that's been brought to my attention called Remnote. And so excited to really deep dive, do some first impressions and share a sort of my thoughts on that app. So that's what we'll be talking about next Thursday. But of course, bring your productivity questions as always, but that'll be like the main topic for the day. I think that's that. So with that said, that is a wrap for this session. Thanks everyone for hanging out today and being a part of this community. I really appreciate each and every one of you. Hope you all have a wonderful day. And with that, I'll be signing off. So thanks again, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.